Hello? My name's Scott Redman. I'm an alcoholic. <clears throat> and Mike just said he was one of those speakers that uh, you never tire of, and Alexander went, <laughs> I'd like to, uh, I can't thank the committee enough and Bill and, and uh, the people who put this thing together for putting it together and for inviting me. This, this round of changed my life 12 years ago, the first time that I uh, participated, and I got to meet uh, my friend Cliff, who's uh, become a, a big part of my life, and there were friendships and relationships started that weekend that have become key parts of my life and my sobriety. And uh, participating in this roundup is a big deal for me. It's, uh, it's, a, it's great to be here. Um, can I see hands of people in their first year, please? Wow. Welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. I can't tell you how glad uh, I am that you're here. I, um, I heard a couple of weeks ago, I think it's the best way I've ever heard a newcomer qualify ever. And I love collecting qualifications. I love, I've heard guys uh, refer to themselves as crack monsters and dope fiends and, you know. Uh, but I was at a meeting, and um, people were raising their hand with less than 30 days. The guy said, my name's Bob, I'm an alcoholic, my name's Carmen, I'm an alcoholic. And a guy got up and said, my name's Tom, big problem. Big problem. <laughs> and then he sat down. <laughs> and I could have gone home right there, because <clears throat> I believed him. This uh, friend of mine has been sober a long time. I met him at my first home group, uh, described his behavior as an alcoholic. He said, most people live, they say, you, you know, <clears throat> most people say, ready, aim, fire. <clears throat> ready, aim, fire. And he said his entire life, he went, ready, fire, aim. <laughs> and uh, I completely get ready, fire, aim. So, you know, I, it doesn't really matter when I aim, you know, after that. If you know, I'd like to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. If you're a drug addict, I'd like to welcome you to AA. If you're a dope fiend, which is somehow worse than any of us, I'd like to welcome you to AA. If you're part of that new, very exotic group that I just, I, Cliff and I actually were introduced to him the same night at the Old Town Speakers meeting. It was the first time we ever heard anybody identify as a tweaker. We'd like to, I'd like to welcome you. You got, there you go. Man has no idea why he's raising his hands. They have no short-term memory at all. Um, I like you guys. I like you guys. Every part of your face is moving in a different direction. <laughs> Touch yourself till you're dehydrated. We're glad you're here. I'm not making fun of you, but I'm coming close. And, I, and I'll tell you, because I don't care if you're like the, like the big, energizing, bunny, tweaking, dope monster, big foot of dope addicts. I, I don't care. I don't care what you got. Just catch alcoholism. I did not have alcoholism when I came to AA. I have a fatal case of it now, um, but I did not have it when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous. I, uh, I caught alcoholism in AA meetings. It enters through the ear, and it infects you, and then you start infecting other people. And uh, there were a lot of things wrong with me when I came to Alcoholics Anonymous, but alcoholism absolutely was not one of them. Um, I'm Jewish, and Jews don't drink because it might dull the pain. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you just don't want to squander any agony opportunity that presents itself. One of the first guys that ever held me in AA, in my first home group, I was a couple weeks sober, and this guy identified, he said, I'm an ex-Catholic, which means I don't believe in God, and I'm therefore positive that God is going to come kill my ass for feeling that way. And I said, I'll sit near him. <laughs> because I completely understood that. So if you're new, I just want to, I want to urge you as much as I possibly can to stick around long enough to get a diagnosis. Just find out what alcoholism is. And I want to tell you, it took me a long, if you had asked me that first day, if I was an alcoholic, I would have said no. I'm glad nobody asked me, you know. Uh, I have... I have this weird reaction to alcohol. I can't stop, I can't moderate once I begin. I'm part of a, of a, a separate class of, of persons who are actually physically allergic to it. And if you're special and a drug addict, try some controlled crack smoking. You know, just fill your mouth up with crack smoke and say, I'm not in the mood, and blow it out. And uh, hats will fill the air. I work alone, but thank you.
Don't get over sober on me. Don't get over sober. Um, and it, it, that would be okay. If it was just a physical allergy, I'd be fine. I really would be fine. But I have this bizarre thinking. It, it, it's, it's referred to as alcoholic thinking. It's the source of a lot of mirth at Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. Um, and I've got it. I've got it. I've got it bad. Um, I, uh, and I still do stuff. I mean, my wife came home. I was making the bed. And I start thinking while I'm making the bed. So I lose track. So... I unfurl the sheet, I hook myself behind the head and drive my head into the bed. And, I, and my wife looks really concerned, you know. I, I, I'm, I'm trying to fix my kid's phone, so I'm gonna call their phone to see if it works. So I call their phone and then I start thinking. And the phone rings and I go, who the hell is calling me while I'm trying to fix the phone? And my kids just go, oh, 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 oh. And this is like a couple of months ago. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going uh, way far back. <laughs> but I've got, this, I've got this nutty thinking. And I've got it. Uh, that's why I do more in AA than I ever have before. Uh, and, uh, and that's why I've been hanging out with people who do more. I hang out, I've been hanging out with people since I got sober. When things get good, they do more. When things get bad, they do more. They just do more. Some years ago, I was a... Uh, about 14 years sober and I uh, needed surgery on my hand and uh, my doctor said, you know, you're gonna need general anesthetic. And I said, general anesthetic? That's great, general anesthetic? Normal people don't get excited about general anesthetic. There's no normal person that really goes, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. I leave the surgery out they don't leave the surgery out. I leave the island. I'm going to be wounded. And, you know, but they don't leave that part out. I do. I do. And I'll tell you why. Because I know about general anesthetic. I know when they hit you with it, they say count backwards from 100. And you go, 100, 99. I love 99. <laughs> I love it. I love it. The difference is I won't trade my, my life in for it. One of the most misquoted lines in the big book of AA for me has always been, I've heard people say, my worst day in here is better than my best day out there. No. <laughs> no. Let's see, a pound of cocaine and an all-female jazz band or a panel of chino. I don't know. What do you want to do? What do you want? <laughs> you gotta be nuts! I had a great time. I love drinking. <laughs> Um, what the guy says at the end of chapter three, basically, is I wouldn't trade my worst day in here for my best day out there, because I won't trade this way of life in. I won't live like a sap anymore. I won't take a, a nickel today when I could have a quarter tomorrow. And I understand that. A couple of years after this uh, thing with my hand, I was seeing a different doctor, and he said, you know, that surgery that you, you needed on that hand, you needed on your other hand. And I said, uh, Guess we'll be having some of that general anesthetic guy, huh? <laughs> and the guy looked at me like I was nuts. He said, you don't need general anesthetic with this. And my first thought was, no, I need another goddamn doctor is what I do. <laughs> now. I just want to tell this story because I see I'm already, I've got a couple of people nodding out on me, which is fine. It's fine. I prefer it if you had just shot Dilutin and there was some excuse. But if you're bored and you could get bored, it is going to be a little bit to go this evening. I want to tell you my favorite story about being bored in AA, because I just haven't told for a while. I love this story. I had a friend named Jeff D, who was at my old, my old home group, and he was brand new, and he was shifting around in this seat, and his sponsor said, what's the matter? And Jeff said, I'm bored. And his sponsor said, well, you know why you're bored. And Jeff said, no. His sponsor said, you're bored because you're boring. That's why you're bored. And it was like an acid moment for him. He just went, wow, dude. He just it flipped him out, you know? And he thought, what a great thing to say to a newcomer, you know? He could hardly wait till a newcomer told him that they were bored. 13 years later, <laughs> no newcomer has told him that they're bored. He's at a meeting at the North Hollywood Group, and uh, he's with this young lady who's new. And she's shifting around in her seat. And he said, what's the matter? She said, I'm bored. And he said, boy, you know why you're bored? She said, yeah, because I'm with you. <laughs> so welcome if you're bored. If you're new, a lot of what I'm going to say tonight is going to sound like this. 
and that's okay. I am great, great. This is the only newcomer I've ever heard. This is like the shortest newcomer joke I ever heard. I called a newcomer today, hello, he lied. At any rate, I, um, I've got this weird thinking that keeps talking to me into taking a drink I can't stop taking. And I developed this spiritual tapeworm, this cancer of the soul that ate me up inside and left me hollow and insane and alone. And that's alcoholism. And I didn't have that the first day I walked in here. I didn't know it. And I didn't know that I was beyond human help. Even though you heaped evidence as to the hopeless on, upon me as to the hopelessness of my situation. And I was deflated of ego at depth enough, and my ego didn't repair itself fast enough, so I let some grace in, and I experienced the, the touch of the master's hand, and I started to get well. And it was a long, ugly trip up until that point. I, uh, Grew up in the Bronx in New York City to a completely insane family. My wife never believed me about my family until she met them. And uh, my mom had thrown an engagement party for us. And my, my Aunt Rose came to the party and wore her wig, and it was backwards. <laughs> and it had a bun on it, so the bun was bouncing off her forehead all night. It, she wore it beret style, sort of jauntily askew. It was a look she was going after. This was not, so she wasn't disoriented. Um, <laughs> if you got anything for free in my family, I meant it was stolen. And I had an uncle who used to get, he was a welder, and he used to get free bales of steel wool. <laughs> like, here's your paycheck and your complimentary bale of steel wool. And um, his wife took a decorating course and made throw pillows for the whole house, and, filled them with the free steel wool. And that, that stuff works its way through on you after a while. So you <laughs> look at the whole room, everybody be moving a little bit, you know? The whole, whole room was like a living, pulsing, breathing thing. <laughs> and, um, and there was mental and physical abuse and chronic institutionalization and suicide attempts and um, and if you're new here, all I've got is good news, because my family didn't have anything to do with making me an alcoholic. I'm not telling you that my family didn't injure me. I was terribly injured as a child. And I'm not telling you I haven't had to do a lot of stuff about that. I have. But I am telling you they didn't make me a drunk. They couldn't possibly have come up with this alchemy of three elements that joined together to create this landscape of resentment, fear, and sexual misconduct that plucked me beyond the possibility of being helped by conventional medicine, clergy, well-meaning people, people who loved me. And I didn't have a clue, and I was being literally eaten by it. Until a couple of months before I got sober, I found my wife locked in a, a bathroom, pregnant with our second child, weeping, convinced that she was giving our baby cancer. And there was nothing wrong with her. We just had alcoholism. So I, uh, I grew up in the Bronx with this crazy family. I got put into therapy for, uh, I was in psychotherapy for 18 years. By the time I got to AA, I was going to be dead, but I was going to understand it. <laughs> and I have no beef against therapy at all. I, I'm in therapy now. Uh, I, 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 my colossal mistake is I was trying to treat my alcoholism with psychotherapy. I mean, the, the, the idea of most therapy is to uncover, discover, unravel, to free associate, to delve in your past, most conventional, sometimes Freudian therapy. Uh, that's some of the treatment. And if, you have any, if, you have, if you're neurotic, I don't know if anyone here has ever been to refer to as a neurotic, you, you have anxiety, you have anxiety, and you come up with a resolution for the anxiety, and it's bad, it's a bad resolution, it's a bad idea. So your solutions are worse than your problems. And that's a neurosis. You just you have anxiety, you have bad resolution, more anxiety. So I go to therapy. I said, well, I'm, I feel terrible. Why? Well, I was so drunk yesterday. I was too drunk to walk, so I drove. <laughs> well, what are we going to do about that? Let's talk about it. I got an idea. What were you thinking just before you did it? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. How are you gonna treat nothing? I feel terrible, why? Well, yesterday, I sharpened a hypodermic needle on the back of a matchbook striker and sucked some heroin up through a fluffed up cigarette filter and then I injected it. I, I just feel terrible. 
What were you thinking just before you did it? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. And if you ask the alcoholic why they've done this thing, why have they acted without reason? Why? How could this happen? My alcoholism goes below the horizon. It stops presenting itself as a real piece of business, and I act without explanation, without reason. I have every reason in the world not to drink, but it stops presenting. Sometimes I'll fall in love, out of love, I'll get a job, I'll lose a job, something will happen, and it'll stay above the horizon as a real piece of business for a period of time, but it's on my own juice, and if it's on my own juice, I'm gonna get distracted, or I'm gonna experience the phenomenon of craving, or the strange mental twist, or I'm, a, a resentment's gonna come up in tag me, or a fear and it's gonna go below the horizon and I am going to act in a way where this meaningless thing is precious to me and I again stomp all over my life. Um, I uh, didn't wanna be an alcoholic when I was a kid. I, uh, so I, I conquered my alcohol problem with marijuana. I like to welcome all the pot smokers here. You remember wow, right? Wow. Wow. Right after wow usually came, what? <laughs> what? Wow. What? Wow. What? 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 Wow. Wow. What? What? Watching a pot smoker is like watching a dog try to run on linoleum. <laughs> There's a lot of activity, but no movement. They, they just can't get a claw in the rug. I overcame my marijuana problem with pills, and, uh, Conquered pills with cocaine. Cocaine is an excellent drug. It's particularly good for sex if you enjoy sex from the Neolithic period. Um, welcome if you're new. I'm glad you're here tonight. We have a sexual inventory. That'll be exciting. Um, and I drank till I didn't want to be a drunk. Alcohol was on the table every day. And I was about, in my early 20s, I was going through a cycle where I was using uh, intravenous drugs, and I was hitchhiking from the Bronx down to Manhattan, and my, I was picked up by my aunt and uncle. My father had had a massive stroke, and uh, I was taken to the hospital, and I couldn't show up for my pop. I couldn't, I couldn't do it. I, the curtain was down. I couldn't even go and touch him in the cheek and tell him I love him and watch him take his light into another room. And I felt like an, a pig, an animal. I had holes in my arms. I couldn't, I collapsed as a son, as a man, as a brother, and I had to do some fast work. I, I couldn't fit the pain in my head, and I came up with something pretty quick, that it was, it was needles and heroin, and all I had to do was never put a needle in my arm again, and I wouldn't be the guy who couldn't show up for his old man. So I didn't, I didn't put a needle in my arm, not for 13 years. Shortly after that, I was acting in a Broadway play, and, uh, this new usherette walked in with long brown hair, and I took one look at her, and I didn't even say hello to her. I walked back into the dressing room of the show, and I stood up on a chair, and I announced to the male members of this cast that if anyone talked to the new usherette with long brown hair, I'd break all the bones in their hands and feet. And we've been uh, married 28 and a half years. <laughs> in part, because we never wanted to get divorced at the same time. I think we're a bit, it's a little, and my wife will be the first to admit that. <laughs> One of the most troublesome and annoying and debilitating defects of character for me in sobriety and out of sobriety has been the defect of mind reading. <laughs> I think that I know what people are thinking, and um, they're never thinking anything good, by the way. Uh, I, I, ne <laughs> I never read a mind and go, and the guy's going, hey, you're pimpy, I like you, you're cool. They're always going, you're a dip, you don't know what you're doing, you're wrong. Um, my wife one day said to me, honey, you're not a mind reader, you're barely a mind user. <laughs> Which, that hurt, that hurt. And we had a great time, we had a great time. I was acting on Broadway, we moved in with each other about a minute and a half later, you know. And, and uh, look, if you're new, you really are gonna, you're gonna hear some wacky stuff about alcoholism now that you're here. Some of it might sound true, and some of it might mean something to you, and some of it might not. The stuff that's been annoying to me over the years, I have yet to find in the big book of AA. Never found it. I've heard, and, but, it, it, but it works for some people. It's not the stuff shouldn't be said, but it's kinda interesting. I've heard alcoholics don't like change. Just do not like change of any kind. I don't like change I don't like. 
But I, I, I love change that I like. I seem to have an endless amount of patience for it. I've never heard anyone get to a podium and say, oh, I hit the lottery, I'm having sex with identical twins, it's killing me. I, I can't take these changes. I've heard alcoholics are perfectionists. I am a pig. <laughs> I, I, the only time that I seem to ever have a, a, an explosion of perfectionism is when my wife is caring for me. Then, that's when the perfectionism really... But my, my favorite, my absolute all-time favorite is uh, that alcoholics are above average intelligence. I have only heard this at Alcoholics Anonymous meetings. I have never heard it at an Al-Anon meeting, ever. Oh, you are wits. It's hard for me to be above average intelligence after I've hooked myself behind the head and driven my head into a bed. And Nancy and I had a great time. Um, and it went on for a while. We had a great time. I was acting in New York. I started directing plays. I had my own theater in New York. We did some great stuff. She started a career. And she's really, after a while, I wish I had noticed, she started becoming very troubled um, at, at a certain point. She became troubled and difficult and argumentative. I didn't know how bad she was getting. And, um, <laughs> I came home one day, we had these 32 ounce iced tea tumblers in the house, and I popped a cork on a bottle of wine and emptied the entire bottle of wine into this glass. Now I'm gonna make a Cliff Roche face now, it's the pre on -pre rat face. This one, right? He does it better than me, he looks like a, a trained a, attack Muppet sometimes, he goes, I said, what? She said, what are you doing? And I looked at her and I said, I'm having a glass of wine. Can a man have a glass of wine in his own house? <laughs> we became so sick that a guy lent us his car and we sold his car. <laughs> I just never tire of saying that. And I'm, I'm as stunned today as I was the first time I realized I had done it, which is... Guy lent us his car. We didn't have rent money. No, no, really. And um, I looked into Nancy's eyes, I said, I am so sick of being a punk, irresponsible kid. I've had it. We're drawing a line in the sand. We are gonna stand on our own two feet. We're gonna sell the car. We're not. <laughs> and she looked at me and said, let's do, with, with tears in her eyes. <laughs> I will never forget that guy's voice on the phone as long as I live. She said, you sold my car? That's like house sitting for someone, and they come back and you're in escrow. What, what, what are you talking about? What do you mean you sold my car? What did I, I was able to sell this car for the same reason that I like general anesthetic. I go from problem, general anesthetic. I go from, let's pay the rent, pay the rent. I leave out grand theft auto. I leave out surgery and grand theft auto. La, 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 la. That's gone, gone. Someone had to forge the pink slip. But we did the right thing, sacrificed. Oh my God. Our son Jesse was born, our son Michael was born, our oldest son Micah, and he, he was really welcomed into the world. We were surrounded by friends and family and got a ton of phone calls. He was really welcomed into our community. And two years and nine months later, when our son Jesse was born, in, in those two years and nine months, we had become completely isolated from alcoholism. No one showed up at the hospital, no one called, no one sent a flower. And it wasn't because people didn't love us. It really, really hurt too much to be around us. It was too scary. We went to the hospital to have Jesse that day. I hadn't paid the doctor, and we didn't know if he was gonna show up. Um, I told you that a couple of weeks before that, I had found Nancy locked in the bathroom, convinced that she was killing our baby. Because there was a spiritual tapeworm in her. Something that had entered our life that our lives kept just running out between our fingers like a handful of water over and over and over again. And we didn't know what it was. And you know, there's, there's not a lot of terrific places to be in a hospital, but the maternity ward gets pretty close when things are okay. It's a pretty cool place. And there was my wife in extreme psychological duress. Jesse was sick when he was born. He was in neonatal intensive care, and there was nobody with her. 
And a doctor who I had never met before called me that night at our home and said, Mr. Redman, where are you? And I said, you know what? I can't find anybody to watch my kid. I have a two-year-old son at home. I can't, I, I, a three-year-old, and I, I can't. Uh... And she said, I'll tell you what. My husband is home. I'll give you my phone number. This is a huge metropolitan hospital. She said, you can bring my, your son to my house, and my, my husband will take care of him so you can be with your family. And I said, no. I had no way to accept this woman's generosity. And how's this? That was the terrible night my son was born. The terrible night my son was born. And, um, and now my poor son Micah had to be locked in the house with me, racked with fear and, and guilt and shame. He would have been better off if I had taken him to the waiting room and left him alone with a coloring book. At least he could have got the hell away from me. And, um, and little were we to know, it's, it's what, gorge, you know, what Bill talks about gorgeously in his story. Little were we to know, this is going to continue for three years. Three years after this awful night. Three years of broken promises, destroyed opportunities. I suffered from chronic success my entire life. By the time I got to AA, I had directed a TV show, a movie. I had my own theater. I had a book on the bestseller list. I did all of these things a time because after I'd leave, they'd move the business so I couldn't find it again. I was the kind of guy, I'd be working someplace 30 or 60 days, and they start blaming each other for having hired me, you know, which is awful when they, you'd got, no, you brought him, no, you, no. <laughs> it's a terrible feeling. Um, and uh, we tried to make a go of it. We tried to move through the alcoholic landscape of our lives, and our children, um, our children just suffered miserably as a result of this disease. When Micah was about four years old, our family was at, uh, at McDonald's, and Micah walked over to a family we didn't know and he had never met before. He walked up to this family and he said to this family, my father's an alcoholic and my mother has cancer. And Nancy walked up to the, the, the horrified, walked to the table, kind of took Micah away and looked at this family and said, I, my husband is not an alcoholic. It, we, we lose, I've heard my wife say as an as a incredibly committed member of Al-Anon, I've heard her talk about this, I've heard her talk about it with new women. We get stupid. We get stupid. Alcoholics get stupid. They're friends and family. It makes us, we act without reason. That, that thinking that's described in the second and third chapter I'll stop after the sixth one. What's the use anyhow? How did it happen again? It's, it, it's right in there. I see it. I saw it in my children. I saw it in my kids. My kids were either pointlessly aggressive en route to a goal that never got attained, or they just threw the towel in. So what's the use? What the hell's the use anyhow? And by April 22nd, 1985, my sons were six and three. They were crushed by alcoholism. They were, not, they were cut out from the society of other children. Their small motor skills were screwed up. They were, uh, they were a wreck. Uh, Nancy and I were tongue-chewing, babbling idiots. Um, and, on, and I put a needle in my arm again. I crossed the line I swore I would never cross. Why? Why not? It was time. I called my therapist in my 18th year of psychotherapy, my first Jungian therapist, and I told him what I had done, and he said to me that morning the exact same thing that Carl Jung told the man who told the man who 12-stepped the man who 12-stepped the man who 12-stepped Bill Wilson. He said to me on the phone that day, there's absolutely nothing that can be done for you. And that's what Carl Jung told Roland Hazard after being analyzed by him and drinking afterwards. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I can't help you. The only thing I can suggest is we have you institutionalized. And then he said to me the thing that Carl Jung couldn't say to Roland Hazard. He said, or you go to a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous or Narcotics Anonymous. Now why I went to the, uh, the meeting is a mystery to me. It's an absolute mystery to me. Why, I'm a guy who loved dental surgery, who looked forward to general anesthetic. Why I didn't go to the mental institution, that's an uninterrupted source of narcotics, that's a chance to be with my people, colorful and adventurous people. That's, that's when you write a book in the nut hut, right? 
Um, <laughs> why I went to that AA meeting is an absolute mystery to me. I got up at 5 o'clock in the morning. I put my best clothes on. I got a bad check to write you. And I went to a clubhouse called Unit A in the San Fernando Valley, right next to a lovely Polynesian-themed bar named the Tonga Hut. I walked into this room, I looked around, and I said to myself, oh my God, oh God, how did this happen? Alcoholics Anonymous, how did I wind up in Alcoholics Anonymous? This is beyond lame. This is beyond church, beyond synagogue. This is some plateau of lameness I never even imagined was available to me. <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous. And the room looked like it was the product of like 200 years of inbreeding to me, you know? <laughs> there were like identical twins carving their initials on each other's feet in the back of the room, as far as I was concerned. <laughs> and everything was a miracle. I'm a miracle. You're a miracle. Oh, the coffee. Oh, what a miracle. The coffee is such a miracle. <laughs> Cliff, I'll, I'll leave this up for you for later on. <laughs> then the... the <laughs> the unsolicited AA information guy, he saw me after the meeting, you know him. He's got a belt buckle large enough to serve an entire fish on. Do I want what you've got? No. No, but thanks for spitting on me. I appreciate it. See you next week. Do we hook a rug next week? What happens? We're gonna, the arts and crafts are going to start next year. I'm waiting for the Jew hunt to start. I know that's going to break out any minute, right? Come on, Jaime, strap these antlers on. Come on, it'll be fun. We'll knock his beanie off. When he bends down to pick it up, we'll push him over. It'll be fun. Come on. Everybody's going. <laughs> Always wanted to run a big buck Jew. I went back to that meeting every morning for a year. And one of my dear friends who I met that first day is in the crowd tonight, who I just adore. And we've known each other almost 20 years, and I just love her to pieces. And the only reason that I think I went back to this room is I was out of plans. If you're new here, I pray for you that you are out of plans. If you're new here and you have a plan, it's probably a beaut. <laughs> Don't use your plan. <laughs> Grab one of us after the meeting and tell us your plan. We want to know the plan. My favorite newcomer plan over the years, the most utilized newcomer plan, has been the one more dope deal to set myself up financially for sobriety plan. <laughs> it becomes more popular the closer you get to Lemon Grove. All right, down there. So if you're new, if you be a mulein, welcome to AA. And uh, some of the closest people to me in Alcoholics Anonymous were sitting in that room, and the people who I met in that room. One of the guys there, Milton M., uh, a couple of months later, his uh, wife, Ruby, became my wife's sponsor and has been my wife's sponsor uh, all these years. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know what happened to me that day. All I can tell you is that I had a window of opportunity. If you're new here, <clears throat> some of us might get a little pushy and a little nutty <clears throat> if you've stopped drinking. You see the not drinking parts of moose. If it was not for the not drinking part, we would be a much bigger organization. I guarantee it. I guarantee it. It's that not drinking thing really screws a lot of people up. Here it is. If you're new, when you want to drink, don't. Yikes! <laughs> it's really crazy. It's a crazy idea. And, um, and I was just crushed enough to let in enough and you know when you're new we, we we get pushy we want we would like to see you take advantage of the opportunity that's been afforded you if you've stopped drinking if you've gotten out of the cycle of spree and remorse for a period of time because sometimes these opportunities disappear really quickly and then times sometimes you hear about people who stay untreated for a long period of time but they don't drink and maybe i could be one of those guys well i didn't i didn't find out and uh I stuck around Alcoholics Anonymous for six months, and I went to meetings. My wife reached out to the Al-Anon family groups. Uh, I know exactly when, because she raised her hand at her first meeting and said, my name's Nancy, I'm, uh, my husband's 37 days sober. And that was the end of my countdown in Al-Anon. Um, <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you, if, 
I would get very confused sometimes when I was new. I would go to AA meetings occasionally and hear people telling uh, jokes about Al-Anon. I'm not talking about good-natured jokes. We tell enough good-natured jokes about alcoholics. I'm talking about mean, uh, you know, until I stuck around long enough to find out that the people who were doing that had no information, real information, about the work being done in the Al-Anon family groups. If they did, they couldn't possibly tell those jokes. It would be like going to a, a meeting and hearing people tell awful stuff about AA. I mean, if it, that happened, I think we'd go, well, you don't know, you can't know. You don't know that a fire gets started here. You don't know what happens. You don't know that people's jaws get pried open and life gets spit into them. You don't know. You couldn't know. And yet, there are times where we tolerate it in AA. And you know what? I only get, I used to have all the votes. I've been whittled down to one by good sponsorship. And if, you know, if, if, if you think it's okay to do that, that's fine. That's your vote. My vote is that it's not okay. It's not. Because there might be a newcomer, like me, out there who's sitting there going, what are you doing? What, that, what is that? I'm like, I was incredibly proud of my wife and happy that she was interested in, in doing this thing. So, um, God bless Alan. I don't, you know, I don't need my wife to go to Alan on, but I sure appreciate it. And uh, when she's doing well, I'm doing better. I'm not doing, you know, um, I, uh, my wellness is not contingent on her, but it's fun. And my wife's Alan on family, <clears throat> and I'm sure a lot of other people use this, but uh, her sponsor always stressed it that when things would start moving a little fast, I don't know, in our family, uh, driving is not good. It's not good. My wife has a set of imaginary driving controls on her side of the car. I'm gonna get her a Fisher Price thing eventually. And there's an imaginary brake that she pushes down on and a lot of body English, a lot of movement, a lot of activity. And I seem to get psychotic when she does this. And, um, and you know when things start moving quick, 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 Ready, fire, aim. You know, things are starting, they're starting to cook, starting to cook. It's like trying to grab soap, you know? And, um, <laughs> and she was encouraged to say, you know, sweetheart, you could be right. Could be right. And one day things are moving really quick, really fast. And, my, um, and I'm, I've grown accustomed to hearing this wonderful thing. Honey, you could be right. It's not much, but it's all I got, you know? And, I, and she goes, you know, sweetie, you could be right. But not today. <laughs> not today. It's not your day. It's not going to happen today. I'll let you know it's your day. Not today, big guy. It's not going to happen. And um, at six months of sobriety, I asked the guy to sponsor me because I knew I was going to drink. I knew it. I had seen it hundreds of times. I consider myself lucky to have stayed sober six months before I got involved in the work of the big book of AA. He was a great guy, he still is a great guy. And he invited me over to his house and he made sure that I had done some reading from the big book of AA and he read chapter five to me. And on, on the way through, he took me through the first two steps. We reached step three, which my friend Clef refers to as the formal articles of, uh, of surrender. I gotta tell you something, I found this out the other day. It was one of the most beautiful expressions of the second step I've ever heard. The root, the, the origin of the phrase carte blanche, which we generally know as carte blanche is to have, you know, a license to do things. And what it comes from is the French phrase, when an army has been beaten so badly, they have to sign a blank treaty. It's a carte blanche. I signed a blank treaty when I got here. <laughs> and your ass has got to be whooped pretty good to do that, because they'll fill it in later. <laughs> And if you're really willing, and you're really willing, you sign a blank treaty of Alcoholics Anonymous. And God willing, you won't have people who are going to have you, you know, wear a grass skirt and touch them while you're chanting the 12 steps. <laughs> Cliff told me that magic would disappear if I ever told anyone, but it's so much fun to have the microphone when he has no microphone. I, I just, I can't, do, this is better than Christmas as far as I'm concerned. And then we reached step three, and we got on our knees and said a prayer together, which I felt was unnecessary and embarrassing, but I did it anyway. And he gave me instructions on how to do a fourth step from the big book of AA. I came back to Don, and I read it to him at uh, nine months of sobriety, and I had an incredible day with him. My life changed that day that I read that fifth step to him. And um, I did step six and seven for the first time, which have become my, my fulcrum of my relationship 
with my higher power, and I uh, wrote up my eight-step list. I try to share this anytime I talk, because it's simply the best reading of step eight I've ever heard. And I heard it, I was a couple of weeks sober at my old home group, and there was a guy, there's a, a, a guy there who had never read chapter five before. His name was Nino, he had a heavy New York accent, and he was there with a hospital group. He had hospital plastic, and he had never read the big book. And he read it for the first time in front of this group, and he got up to step eight, and he read, made a list of all those we had harmed, and became willing to make amends to them all. Jesus Christ. He looked out into the room as if to say, have you seen this? <laughs> Do you know what the hell is in here? Oh, it was so gorgeous. It was so pure. It's all I saw. I didn't say anything else on the list. Not those people, not that money. I, I would not have taken that much money if I knew I had to give it back. You think I'm an idiot? I'm above average intelligence. <laughs> if you're new, don't worry about it. It's eight steps from where you are anyway, for God's sake. And eight is not the annoying one. It's nine. It's the really, really annoying one. It's the pay it back step. It's, so I wrote up my eight-step list. I didn't know what I was going to do about it. I didn't know what I was going to do about my wife and my kids and my, and my dad. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was blessed with a sponsor who refused to tell me how to make amends. He said, do your job in AA. I don't know how this is going to come out. Do your job in AA. Let's get to work. And I was hanging out with a bunch of guys who just, they did it. They just did it. They were on the board of our home group and trustees. And they had panels to Warm Springs and to Hatchapi. And they, uh, and they answered phones at Central Office. And they, um, this buddy of mine was answering phones at Central Office. And this woman called and said, uh, how, what's the waiting list like now? And uh, my friend said, what are you talking about? I said, well, two weeks ago, I told my husband I had to get the hell out of he joined, unless he joined AA. And he called and he said, they, you guys put him on the waiting list. And I wanna, uh, just wanna see where, where he was, you know, where he was. And my, my friend said to her, I said, I think it's gonna be a bit of a wait for you. I said, <laughs> so I started doing my job in Alcoholics Anonymous. I addressed my inventory as my spiritual task, and I had to start doing a lot of embarrassing, unpleasant things. I had to start going to school and standing up for my kids, going in and advocating for my children and seeing what resources were available to help them because they had been so terribly injured. And a lot of teachers were very angry at my children because they were perceived as kids with a lot of potential who weren't using it as if they had a choice of whether or not to use it. What a crazy idea that is. And I would, one teacher said to me, you know, sometimes I just want to grab him and shake him. And I said to her, you know what? He's already been all shook. It's not, it's not what we need now. I said, and this was really hard. I said, my children are, are ill because I've been very sick and we're making a beginning. Can you help us? And not once did anyone say no. Part of that was my wife and I were getting spiritually we were growing, and we stopped going to drowning people and asking for swimming lessons. And when they'd say, glub, 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 we'd get pissed off, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and the boys got tested, and they got all sorts of uh, special ed. And, and, and uh, one teacher said, well, get them into music. There's small motor skills, or, or let's see if the big motor stuff will help them. And Jesse wanted to play drums, and, uh, and I didn't have any dough. But I'll tell you what I did. I went and I bought him a drum pad, which is a piece of wood. It's a 15 buck thing. It's a piece of wood with a piece of rubber and a couple of sticks. And I went back to my home group and I told the guys, I'll tell you why I told them, because they wanted to know, because they were interested, because they were really excited about our family. I wasn't bragging. They wanted to know this stuff. And within a couple of months, the AA drum set showed up at our house. Uh, there were a lot of burnout drummers in my group at that time. Guys are showing up with these mega death drums, you know. Dude. And uh, Jesse sat behind a drum set. You could barely see him. I mean, he, he would disappear. And a couple of years ago, my kids played uh, the House of Blues on the Sunset Strip. And they burnt the dump down. Burn it down. Playing in this packed room, eight, nine hundred kids, playing hip-hop music, elbow to elbow. 
these two gorgeous, poised boys, you know. And there's a group of weeping middle-aged alcoholics over to the side. You know. <laughs> Kids are going, what is with the crying old people, man? What the, what, what's that all about? My son Michael was uh, eight years old. I had been in the program for two years, and I went to make him a lunch, and I said, what do you want in your hot dog? He said, I want mustard, onions, and lettuce. And I went, lettuce? He said, okay, I don't want lettuce. And he walked away, came back about 45 minutes later, and I'm not altering one syllable. He said to me, I will never again allow your opinion of what I want affect what I ask for. <laughs> so I asked him to sponsor me at that point. <laughs> What's that? What is, what is that? A couple of years after this, I've been in the program about four years, Jesse got into a schoolyard accident, got, broke his uh, wrist in a growth plane, which if you know about kids, that's cartilage that's gonna turn to bone. Can't be messed with when it's set. But he's a younger brother, and he's come home with a cast, with a weapon. And now, he's got a level playing field, and he wants to get as much mileage out of this thing as he possibly can. And they can't do it, because if he messes this thing up, it's bad. And Mike is into it, they're, you know. And I said, and I told him twice, and it's not, and I finally screamed at Micah, you can't do this. I got right up in his face, and I yelled at him, I said, it's zero tolerance, we can't do this. He walked away from me, walked into his room, and he slammed the door. Slam the door. I got the dead tick going on. Slam the door. So I go to his room and I open the door and before I can unload on him, he looks at me and he says, I didn't say you were wrong out there. You were right. But a big guy just got in my face and screamed and yelled. I didn't tell you you were wrong. Don't tell me I can't be mad. What, what is it? What the hell is that? What is that? That's something he had been watching his mother and I trying to do, trying to do, to stand up for yourself and tell someone you, what you need without telling them what to do. To overcome a fear of confrontation, to not scream and yell or hold it inside, but to tell the truth without telling them what to do. To take no crap and give no crap. What a design for a living. What a perfect thing. And my son's taught it to me. And my, you know, I would, because I felt so guilty about my children's injuries, I wouldn't, I, when they'd start to fight, I'd pull them apart, and they'd fight again, and I'd pull them apart, and they'd fight again. And Nancy said, you don't know how to fight. You don't let them finish. So I started sitting on my hands, and they learned how to finish, something I don't know how to do. I don't know how to fight. I'd scream until you shut up, or I'd cry until you shut up. I also like to loom. I'm a loomer. I'm big. I like to get a light behind me so you're in a shadow when I'm looming. It's like total eclipse of the Jew if I get you right in there, right? And if I can get like a scream, a cry, and a loom into one fight, that's a hat trick. That's the Scott Redmond couples retreat. You just had it right there. I don't know how to fight. Don't know how to be in a marriage. Don't know how to clean. Don't know how to live like a grown man. Don't know how to feel like a grown man. I don't know grown men make a bed. I think somewhere in the back of my twisted mind that a certain amount of housework should equal a certain amount of sex. <laughs> that there should be conversion tables on the back of cleaning products of housework to sex. And I know there's someone out here tonight going, marketing, I smell, <laughs> I smell, let's see, one more dope deal to set myself up for an like sobriety. Conversion table. And we made a beginning as a family. And, uh, we moved down the line together, and uh, we found a great comfort in one another's company. Um, my wife was blessed with a sponsor who, was, uh, who didn't beat her up, and I was blessed with a sponsor who applied the scalpel of truth with the anesthetic of love. And, um, and we, we had great examples, really incredible examples in Alcoholics Anonymous. And, uh, we uh, stayed sober for a while. I, uh, I've had a lot of problems in sobriety. I know that there are people who haven't had problems in sobriety. I'm incredibly happy for them. And, I, uh, and I'm not saying that you have to have problems in sobriety. And I've had a, a bunch of problems in sobriety. I, I've had problems in my marriage. I've had problems with sex. I've had problems with, I went up to over 300 pounds of sobriety. Uh, what does that have to do with sobriety? Absolutely nothing unless you're going through it. 
Absolutely nothing. And I would pray in six and seven. I write, I'm resentful at Scott for being overweight. It affects my self-esteem, pocketbook, ambition, personal relations, and sex. And the defects are self-serving, gluttony, shame, guilt, and stubbornness. I'd read it to my sponsor and go have a pie and a bowl of spaghetti. <laughs> and I'd write it and read it and write it and read it and write it and read it. And my sponsor's finally saying, you're not using the first five propositions in the book. What's going on, man? Where are you changing? Where are you using this as a, as a fulcrum for change? And I go, Pop, what do you got? And I'd hear him go, go to Overeaters Anonymous. And I go, what else you got? <laughs> and finally, after uh, my health being threatened, being over 300 pounds, I went to OA. I went to OA, I said, hi, I'm a circuit speaker. And they said, yes, and a very fat circuit speaker. <laughs> I'm really glad you're here. I said, would you like me to talk? They said, no, your mouth's full, uh, don't talk. What does this have to do with sobriety? Nothing unless you're going through it. I've been to other 12-step programs. I'm in therapy now. I've gone to the Feldenkrais technique and used that for my back pain. I've not done one single one of these things instead of AA. I've done every single one of them because of AA, because I've been hanging out with seekers, because of the inventory process. The minute I do any of them instead of AA, then I've started that process, haven't I? I've started that process of watching it go below the horizon and stop presenting itself as a real piece of business. My alcoholism has stayed buoyed above the horizon as a real piece of business for 19 years and 11 months, even when I'm not concentrating on it. Because it's buoyed on the heads and shoulders of the men and women of AA. When I read my fifth step, I read about a lot of stuff. I read about a kid named Mark who used to kick my ass when I was a kid from the time we were five till we were 10. I had to write, go all the way back and write about that stuff. He humiliated me at our first spin the bottle uh, contest. You know, I had to write about Nazis slaughtering Jews. And I had no defects of character on that resentment and my sponsor said, Scott, you don't understand. You don't understand. They're not asking you if the event is your fault. I'm resentful at Nazis for slaughtering Jews. They're not asking you if the event is your fault. They're asking you if the resentment is your fault. Was the event your fault? No. Is the resentment your fault? Every time, with no exception and no loophole. Because a normal person would do a lot of things about Nazis. They could give money to political groups, work against them, do all sorts of stuff. But I don't do that. I feel sorry for myself. I'm a hypocrite and a bigot because if I think you are associated with that in any way. I don't even want to know who you are. I'm an opportunist. I'm not living in today. I'm a grudge holder. I think that's enough for right now, don't you? <laughs> and he set me free. My sponsor set me free. He changed my life in that moment, that day. I was in my first year of sobriety and I um, was becoming sort of a spiritual Goliath. I uh, <laughs> started sponsoring guys. And I was being, I had a ghostwriting job for 20th Century Fox, and I was being considered for a job as a staff director on a sitcom. I thought this would be really good. I thought this would really be good if I got this job. It would be very good for the men that I sponsored. <laughs> because they would see me prospering, they'd really see the program at work. So I directed one episode, I went to a picnic they were having they, before they uh, made the decision about who the staff director was gonna be. And uh, I, I went to this picnic bringing nothing. I went there to get a job. I was bringing nothing. And I uh, walked over to the executive producer and he had a beer. He said, I have one of these. And I said, sure. And I went over to a cooler. I picked up a beer. I guess the wind hit me. I don't know. It's a mystery to me. And I said, you're a dead man. And I put the beer down. I called my sponsor. And I did the work. I was humiliated that I almost drank. And I had to sit down and write the resentment against myself for almost drinking. And they didn't give me the job. And I was resentful at them. And what my sponsor said to me that day after I read the inventory, he said, Scott, when you do six and seven today, when you draw close to him and he reveals himself to you, when you humbly ask him to remove these defects, and humbly isn't, take him if you can, big guy. <laughs> humbly isn't, take him, you rotten. Humbly is, pop. I have made an identity of these things. I am so attached to them. They are precious to me. And my problems go below the horizon. I keep repeating, please, please help me. He said, when you do six and seven today, you better ask your God what you're gonna to have to do to stay sober. You have the show business God, apparently. 
I said, what? He said, well, what keeps you sober? I said, God. He said, God keeps you sober. You didn't get a show business job and you almost drank. So I guess you have the show business God and he has abandoned you utterly. <laughs> when I came into AA, I heard people, I heard God getting people jobs, God getting people in relationships, God getting people parking spaces. <laughs> I'm not gonna talk about it. Years ago, my family got nailed in the Northridge earthquake. We got injured really badly. Uh, I got a bad physical injury, our house got cracked up, and the kids, it, we were right in the epicenter. A guy died right near us, it was really bad. Shortly after this, uh, we were at an AA function out of town, and this woman who used to live in LA came up to me at this function and said, oh, I am so glad God got us out of LA before the quake. And I said, oh, so he likes you. He likes you, but we're crap, but he likes you. Oh, that's great. And she said to me, I guess he just felt you had some lessons to learn. I'm out of here. I'm out of here. I can't. I have no interest in living that world. Living in that world where I've got a God saying, get him. Get the Redmond boy. Get him. Get him. No evacuation plan for you, Jew boy. Get him. Get him. Turn his wife to salt. Kill his goat. Put a finger in his eye. Get him. Smote his ass. Smote him. Smote anyone he talks to. We'll figure it out later. I, I, can't, I can't live in a world where I've got a God saying, well, let's key your car. It's boils for you. You're due for a rash. I believe St. Thomas, I believe the mystics, I believe the big book of AA. <clears throat> to know God is to not know God, that God is absolute and complete mystery, that no one can fully comprehend or define that power which is God. And every time I ascribe a personality or an intention to my higher power, I make them this small, this small. I know that God's keeping us sober. I'm just here to share my story. Wouldn't do me any good. That is a mystery I used to be very uncomfortable with. I'm very comfortable with it today. As a matter of fact, I crave that mystery. I've misidentified people in AA and approaches to AA as God. I've misidentified meetings with God. It's a big mistake. I don't know who I injure more, them or me. You know? It doesn't mean I can't respect them. It doesn't mean I can't learn from them. It doesn't mean I can't love them. But, but. And, um, so when I did six and seven that day, I said, Pop, you got it. Take show business. I'm done. I'm done. You can have show business. I am willing to do anything for a living. Because you see, my God doesn't care what I do for a living as long as I do my job in AA. My God is not a child annihilator. My God expects me to do my job in AA if my children are annihilated or not. And I know plenty of people who have lost children in Alcoholics Anonymous and who are astounding astounding examples of this program. My God doesn't care if I live in the house in the hill or the refrigerator box. I do, <laughs> and, and that's fine, as long as I want it and it doesn't become an attachment or a craving. And, um, and I said, Pop, I'll do anything you want for a living, just keep me sober. And within three months, I was working as a cook on a catering truck. And I looked up to God and I said, I did not mean this. This wasn't even on the long list. Where, where did this even come from? Now in LA, when they make a TV show or a movie, they hire a caterer, it's a, you're on a, a vehicle on a movie set, it's a, a teamster job, it's great dough, but I'm Scott Redman. So the first movie that I cater, the, the producer, executive producer and star of the movie is a guy who I've worked with in the business. And he comes into work, he sticks his head on the truck that first morning and he says, uh, can I have a burrito? Scott? I said, what happened, babe? He said, is this your truck? I said, no, but it's my spatula. <laughs> I went home and I called my sponsor. I said, we're getting the gift now. We're really, it's beautiful. We're really getting the gift. The gift of sobriety is such a beautiful thing. And he said, sounds like you've got a resentment. And I wrote 10 steps, man. I wrote them and wrote them. I'm resentful of Scott for working on a kitchen truck. I'm resentful. I wound up serving guys who I had directed in TV shows, actresses I directed in TV shows, assistant directors who I had been the director with, stage managers who had worked for me. I'd come back to the home group with a new tale of humiliation every week. And the guys would go, ah! <laughs> And you know what? My son Jesse asked me to teach him how to cook. 
Now, I didn't think we were going to get intimate that day, that way. I thought we'd get intimate on Oscar buffing night. When we buffed my Oscars, we'd get together and buff my Oscars and my Emmys. That's how I thought my son and I would develop a relationship. <clears throat> but he wanted to learn how to cook. And uh, I started showing up and, and, and uh, giving him a dime for their nickel. And uh, I became a really good cook. And I started helping some guys who felt they had fallen from a height when they came to AA. I had a friend named Paul who uh, used to say this prayer. He, he, because he felt that he had fallen from a height when he came in. He said, God, I'm willing to do anything for a living. Just keep me sober. But please, don't let it be as bad as what you did to Scott. Please, <laughs> don't. Just don't. It's like being voted most attractive man in your cell block. It's, uh... And then uh, one night, the star of the sitcom that I didn't get the job directing walked in as a newcomer to my meeting. And uh, I had done the work on it, and I was cool. And I welcomed him. And... Uh, I welcomed him and, and uh, hung around with him, and he heard me talk a couple of times, and he said, will you show me the work in the big book? And I said, it would be a pleasure. And I was just, you know, I talked about, I, I was basking. It was so great that I was, I was so free to be able to help this guy and really genuinely help him and not want anything from him. That show was still continuing to be produced at that time. And he walked into my house late for this appointment, which happens often, you know. And I said, geez, I'm sorry I'm late. Uh, our new director, my job, that's my job, the new director has my job. Mark, the kid who used to kick my ass. Get a hobby. Get a hobby. Get some outside interest. Wow. Wow. I waited years before I told the guy, the guy who came to help me, I waited years until he got sober and, and I pulled him aside one day and I said, dude, I gotta tell you what happened the day you came, that was really interesting. And uh, I continued to show up and be a good cook and uh, I cooked for about three years and um, at the age, uh, after about three years was over, I got an overture made to me by a big time um, uh, company called Catching Public Relations for this big comedy writing job. And I felt at this point, you know, I was really sponsoring a lot of guys by this time. I really felt, oh my God, this is going to be great for the guys I sponsor. I mean, great, because they'll have seen me suffer, and now they'll see me prosper thusly. This is just going to be fantastic for them. So I did a, a videotape for these guys, and I went cuckoo before I even found out. My brain blew up. I mean, I just, you can't, when, when you're living that way, and you're used to uh, and you have relative experience living spiritually okay a lot of the time, it just feels like your appendix is burst, you know. And uh, I did the inventory, I read it to my sponsor, and, um, and I was cool. And a couple of weeks later, I found out I did not have the uh, job with Ketchum, and I was fine. And shortly after that, I got a call to cater some commercials up in the mountains above LA, in Arrowhead. And I drove the truck up there, and I grabbed the call sheet, which gives you all the information about the shoot, and I saw that the commercials were for Ketchum Public Relations. I'm feeding them now. Now I'm feeding them. And um, I looked down at the end of the truck, there's a guy videotaping me. I said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm taping the making of the commercial. He's taping my humiliation. He's going to tape, he's going to send it back to New York, and the guys are going to go, man, is that Scott Redman with the meatloaf? That's unbelievable. So I, I went back to my hotel, I called my sponsor, and I said, oh, we're getting a gift now. Oh, yeah. Oh, oh, it's a miracle. It's just a miracle, 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 a miracle. It's a miracle. And he said, uh, he said, I guess God had enough writers who needed a few cooks today. And then he said, you know, you told God you wanted to work for Ketchum, and you forgot to tell him what you wanted to do. If you're new, I want to welcome you to AA. The good news is our problem mainly rests in our mind. Alcoholics Anonymous is the only text about recovery from a fatal illness that leaves the sufferer in better condition than they were in before they contracted the disease. AA, as far as I know, has the only text about recovery from a fatal illness that contains the sentence, we absolutely insist on enjoying life. There's no book about cholera that says cholera is a hoot. <laughs> You're going to love cholera. Then you'll meet other people who just caught cholera. 
And the problem is, is our problem mainly rests in our mind. You know. Um, if you're new, I, I want to welcome you to AA. If anybody sticks their finger in your chest and says that's the way AA is, I'm just telling you, I've steered clear of those guys. Alcoholics Anonymous was founded by a bunch of acid dropping, nice and eating, Ouija board playing wackos. <laughs> Seekers who are always saying more, what's more? Henry James, what's William James, what's more? What's happening? What do we got? You know? Please read the history of Alcoholics Anonymous. Please read AA Comes of Age. Please, please read the big book of AA. It'll make, it'll, I swear to you, the meetings will stop being confusing. Because I read this material and I go to meetings and go, oh, he's talking about AA. He's not talking about AA. I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> but I judge no man because I'm too spiritually developed. If you're new here, I want to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. I want to suggest that you take this thing as seriously as you possibly can and go out there and have the time of your life. Welcome to AA. Welcome home. Thanks so much for having me, team. We hope you've enjoyed this recording. To obtain additional copies, receive a free catalog of AA and Al Anon talks, or to find out about our Cape and CD of the Month Club, call Encore Audio Archives at 1 800 878 1308 or visit our website at www.12steptapes.com.